AI can work in NLP. I think for a long time, NLP was the the realm of if then else uh, thing, just uh, just like uh, coding, regex, and this kind of very hand engineered stuff. But now the the data driven approaches start to work really. Hello and welcome to a whole new episode of Engati CX. I am your host Drishti, and today we have a tech expert with us on the show. But before I introduce you to our guest, allow me to introduce you to the magic of Engati. Engati is the world's leading multilingual no-code digital CX platform, available across 14 channels with 45,000 solutions created across 186 countries in every domain and use case. Engati has also been recognized as a top platform. by inc.com tech world cio and many others we run the engati blog video channel and the engati cx podcast receiving upwards of 400000 visitors annually and now for our guest thomas wolf is the co-founder and chief science officer at hugging face hugging face is all about democratizing nlp one commit at a time and he leads the science team there with a focus on the most complex technical and legal situations Thomas proved his ability to autonomously set up comprehensive and creative solutions to complex issues. So welcome to the show Thomas. We are really happy to have you. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to be here as well. So before we begin with the interview with you, uh, do not forget to subscribe to Engati and tap the bell icon below to get access to all exclusive content from thought leaders around the world. So Thomas this year in March you gave a talk on computational linguistics. So uh, what do you think are the major challenges there and how can people or we overcome them? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, challenges. If I can list them uh, I think there are some computational challenges the the state of the art models they are really really big now they can be difficult to use in in application they can be difficult to deploy for like a real time application so this is one problem huh? if you want to use billion billion parameters model this actually cost a lot and so there is this this question of efficiency which is one thing we've been trying to to focus on at hugging face developing distilled and smaller model that are more efficient to use now there are a lot of other question as well one question for instance is robustness this model are, are trained on state of the art on public data sets that are that are public benchmark but when you try to deploy them in real life application they can often fail in unexpected uh, ways so you 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 they fail differently than humans fail so you you don't really expect their failure sometimes you're like oh what I, i thought this was very easy there is like typos for instance they can be very sensitive to typos which is bad because in real life we have a lot of typos um so yeah we need to make them more robust so this is one thing we call that brittleness and they have also something which is called spuriousness which is when you train them on a data set that is for instance imbalanced or data set which have easy heuristics like you you did not design your training data set carefully enough for it to really reproduce the real life use case then they will very quickly learn the heuristics they will very quickly quickly learn the shortcuts they will learn that oh there is a majority class and i should always predict this majority class or they will learn that there is some easy answer because that's easier to learn so they are like i, I call them lazy sometimes they they are very quickly learn the, the simple heuristics and this is uh, what we call spuriousness that's also something we want to try to avoid and now there are some more general problems also about just common sense they are lacking what we would call common sense so they can say even even the biggest one even gpt3 even the open ai very very large models they can say stupid things because they well one of the reason is that they are mostly trained on text only and there's a lot of thing we don't say in text there's a lot of thing they don't have access to so there was actually a nice article <coughs> that i participated in the, in the in the MIT tech review last week no not even last week there was two days ago on on one way to try to overcome that and the beginning of the article asked gpt3 what color is a sheep and gpt3 is not sure actually is like is hesitating between white and black because we also use a lot the, the word black sheep in english 
And so this is a lack of common sense because everybody knows what is actually the real color. That black sheep is mostly, well, there are some black sheep, but they are mostly like real exception. And that's why we use this word in English to, to actually indicate an exception. But they lack this common sense because we don't write it down in text. We don't write the things which are too obvious to say. And so this is another problem that, that, that we see in the model. And now the last problem that I think is also very important is the problem of continual learning. The world is evolving and these models, they are really made, well, the way we made them usually is, at, at least in academia, is to train them once and for all. Like BERT, for instance, was trained once, DPT-3 was trained once. And for instance, GPT-3 knows nothing about COVID, which is too bad because today it's really a, a huge part of our world. It's really a huge part of how we interact, how we do business uh, over the world. But GPT-3 has no idea what this is. And it's very hard to add new knowledge pieces to these models, to this uh, large model. So we call that continual learning. And it's, um, it's a research area where people try to find way to make this model evolve, to be able to add new knowledge. Like the president of the United States will probably change. <laughs> and so, uh, but these models were all trained with Trump as president, but we should be able to update that and say, okay, now there is, there is a new piece of knowledge, something has changed in the world. And this is also another problem. So there, there, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, these models, they, they work a lot better than the previous generation of, of text, uh, text processing model, like natural language processing model, but there are still a lot of big challenges. And we are tackling some of these challenges at Hugging Face. There are many, many possibilities to try to overcome this. Well, it's not clear which is actually the, the goal solution. It's not clear what will be the silver bullets. Um, but there are definitely possibilities to overcome that. Mm, that's so, true. Yeah. So uh, when you talk about the continual learning part, so um, like you just said that uh, the president of the United States has changed. So do you think that one information can be fed to the model or it, it still has to go through a long process of mm. feeding information to wow. that particular model? Like how does that work? How can we do some continual learning? <clears throat> yeah, there are several ways, but uh, I think one of the most promising way, uh, which is some of the model we have very recently added to the Transformers library at Hugging Face, which is this library of state-of-the-art models, um, is to use model with a retrieval components. So these type of models, they have two parts. One part is the classical neural network, and the other part is kind of a database that was generated by the neural network. So it's part of the model. It's a bit like having the training data set inside the model, uh, but it's a bit smarter because the model process uh, the, the training data set so that it can be very easily queried. So each time you give it an example, it will query the closest uh, piece of information in its database and it will use that as uh, additional information, okay? Another cool thing is that this database, you can update it. So for instance, let's say it's Wikipedia, this database, huh? you have processed Wikipedia with your models to build this database. Then you can just update and uh, process the new version of Wikipedia with the updated president. And now the model know how to, how to handle a, a new president. So that's one way. And the nice thing is that it's very data efficient. I mean, not really data, but it's very computational efficient. You don't need to retrain the full model. You just update the part you need. And um, now it's not sure it will be the, the, the silver bullet for everything, but we, we think this kind of hybrid retrieval model are very, are very efficient, are very interesting. Okay. So this specific model is called RAG. For instance, there are, there are several types of models like this. There, the first one was, uh, I think, Real. That was a Google model. And there was DPR, which was Facebook. They, they are mainly de developed by Google and Facebook. And the recent one that we've added is, is called RAG, which, is, which means retrieval on mounted generation. So it's a model with, with a retrieval components. Okay. Um, uh, can you tell us something about what NLPL is and what are its objectives? That's a very nice uh, group of... Um, of um, research laboratory in, uh, in the north of Europe. Mm -hmm. Hmm. They are in Denmark, Finland, and Norway, <clears throat> and they, are, they organize the winter school uh, 
this year that was this year yeah this year this year was so long <laughs> it looked ages ago that was this year but before covid and so i went to to teach in this in this uh in this winter school so winter school is like a place where graduate students and, and professor and basically a master student can go to to follow like two weeks of classes intense classes so with uh, Joachim Goldberg, we, we gave two, two weeks of, um, no, that was one week actually, act yeah. One week of intense classes on uh, natural language processing. And, uh, and I talked about transfer learning, how you can use pre-trained language models and things like that. Well, this group is actually really nice. If you want to check in the models from Hugging Face, we have um, a lot of translation models. We have actually a thousand models for translation between uh, between I think yeah about a thousand model uh, thousand language pairs and these models are developed by Helsinki NLP which is part of the Nordic language processing group and some of these models for translation are actually a lot better than Google Translate which if you want to, to try some of that if you want to, tr to translate between some low resource languages between some rarer languages you can check the helsinki nlp models on, on hugging face hub and they are they are developed by this by this group they're really nice so i'll even check that out so, um, so yeah. are there any new developments in nlp and what does the future of nlp look like so I think, uh, yeah, there are many new developments. So the retrieval model I've been talking about is something I find interesting. Uh, a lot of current developments are also around trying to make these models more efficient. So we've seen a lot of uh, new architectural variant of, so the transformers, they are the main architecture that people use today. And we have seen a lot of more efficient transformer going out today so that they can process sentence faster and more efficiently. Uh, and now another area that I found very interesting personally is to try to extend a bit from, from NLP and to go to multimodal models, for instance. So we start to have a few models that can process text and image in the, in the Hugging Face uh, library. And this is pretty nice to be able to well, to add some common sense, I was talking about the color of sheep earlier. Well, if you have an image where you can see the color of a sheep, where you can see the color of animals, where you can see all this common sense stuff, if you can give an image to the model, then you can add a lot of common sense to the model. So we start to see it's very interesting developments here where it's actually starting to work, I would say, like adding image helps text. And so we can think about reaching a bit like what we do humans, we use a lot of different modalities to access the world. We use a lot of different modalities to understand what's happening with images, sound, touching, just not language. We're not just about language. And so we start to be able to do some interesting thing around that with models. So this is not pure NLP because we are leaving the text only field, but I think that's actually the direction uh, that the field could go to solve some of the problem that we have today. So I think the future of NLP is bright <laughs> and very interesting. NLP is definitely now the hottest field in AI. I think it's the most exciting field. And it's also its future will be, in my opinion, to kind of englobe all AI. Like all AI will kind of come together under this, um, this NLP, where NLP is a way to actually store and process knowledge, I would say, because language is really how we human store and kind of express knowledge this is really one one very important way but then we need to connect that to all the rest we need to connect that to images we need to connect that to everything that is in life yeah and uh, how does it work with um, like the voice thing so currently if we are typing something and then we say it there might be differences like there can be a tone of sarcasm that we put in so we don't really mean that question but it's we just want a rhetorical answer for that so how does the system is the system still able to recognize that or how is how does that go behind yeah i think today it doesn't work yeah. <laughs> i'll be very clear this is very tricky this is very hard i mean i 
actually even for humans this is hard right to recognize if somebody is actually sarcastic or not you often right like oh i'm not sure are you serious it's, it's very hard even for humans and so definitely with ai techniques with speaks to text recognition we are i think we're still like a long way from being able to do that yeah yeah unfortunately but yeah that's a tough that's a very tough problem that's true so um, if some organizations need to get started on their journey towards adopting ai and nlp in their system so how how can they start so yeah that's a good question i think we there's a lot of uh, ways depends also um, where you want to to start from it depends if you want to build the tech in house or not mm -hmm. uh at Hugging Face, we're probably a bit uh, the, like the entry barriers to use our tool is a bit high. I think we try to lower that, but we originally we were already building tools for researchers in NLP. And so we were assuming that people kind of know a lot of knowledge about the field. They know how the models work. They have very likely read the papers from Google, or Facebook, or OpenAI or, or Hugging Face that uh, was described in the, the, the models. But now that our tools start to be used by, by more and more people, uh, we're seeing people who kind of come to our tools and because they are very easy to use, they can start using them, but they don't really have the knowledge, the underlying knowledge. So what we've started to do is first actually to write, to write a lot of tutorials and, uh, and to open a forum. So we now have a forum discuss at uh, discuss.huggingface.co. Uh, we also have a like a lot of tutorials and starting to make some videos or so, which is probably how you, what, what you were discussing in the beginning, I, I, make, I made a long video, but we want to keep developing that. We want to keep making more accessible resources and also to make some, some, some of our tools easier to access. Like um, right now it's very easy to uh, spin out a, a BERT model, for instance, to process text. But if you want then to use it on your specific task, on your specific business case, you have text classification or something, then there is a step which is high, I think. So, so this is something we're working on. Um, yeah, so, so if you're building your knowledge in-house, I think just uh, you can just take classes. I think the, the most simple classes will be the fast.ai class, uh, if you want to, to have a crash course in NLP. But if you don't really want to build the tech, but you just want to, to find people to help you, well, that's something we're building right now. So you can also just reach out to us and uh, this helps us uh, decide what we, what we want to develop. What are the tools that are mostly needed by the community? That's really helpful. And are there any other sound bites that you would like to leave with our audience? Yeah, I think you should, you should start to think that AI can work in NLP. I think for a long time, NLP was the, the realm of if then else uh, thing, just, uh, just like uh, coding, regex, and this kind of very hand engineered stuff. But now the, the data driven approaches start to work really. So this is something you should definitely investigate. If, you, if you're in the NLP world, if you would process texts in your company, Know that it starts to work and there are tools that, that, that can be used to process the, the text more efficiently. They could, can, these tools can be used to make, like to make really faster some process that you had before. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks. So um, your insights that you have given are really valuable and the audience will really enjoy this interview. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks. So we'll be back with a new episode with a brand new expert soon. So stay tuned and we'll see you around for the next one.